In chapter 7 of the methods text, we talk about solving initial value problems. Initial value problems are those for which we solve, say, an nth order ODE or system of ODEs given initial conditions, all specified at the same point in the domain, usually the left side of the domain. We do this by extrapolating from the known initial conditions to all other points in the domain. On the other hand, when solving boundary value problems, we similarly have a nth order ODE, or a system of ODEs, but instead of being given initial conditions, we're given boundary conditions. These are known values of the state variables at different points of the domain. Usually, these are the extrema of the domain. And since we know the values of the state variables at the extrema of the domain, we find the solution by interpolating between these known boundary conditions to find the values at all other points in the domain. So the difference between solving initial value problems and solving boundary value problems is that when solving initial value problems, we extrapolate from a known point, and when solving boundary value problems, we interpolate between known points. Now there are various ways which the boundary conditions can be defined. Assume we have a boundary value problem that's a second order ODE in the independent variable x for the dependent variable y, and we want to know the solution between the points a and b in the domain. Now this cannot be a first order ODE if we want to define a boundary value problem because a first order ODE can be solved with only one known condition. For boundary pro value problems, the order of the ODE must be two or higher, or we must have at least two dependent variables. If we know the value of y at the extrema of the domain, y at a and y at b, then we have what are called Dirichlet boundary conditions. The Dirichlet boundary conditions for the solution are illustrated by the cartoon here, where y at a and y at b are known, and the problem is to find the values of y between a and b. We can also define what are called Neumann conditions for a problem like this. The Neumann conditions are defined by specifying the derivatives of y at the points a and b in the domain. That's illustrated by this cartoon, where the broken line represents our solution, and we know the slope or of the tangent line at y a and the slope of the tangent line at y b. We can also have what are called Robin boundary conditions. The Robin boundary conditions are defined as a known value for some linear combination of y and its first derivative at two points in the domain. So y at a and its slope are combined to give a known value and y at b and its slope are combined to give a known value. Each of the three types of boundary conditions we discussed on the previous slide is commonly encountered when writing balance equations. Here are some examples of each type of boundary condition when we write balance equations for momentum, thermal energy, and chemical components. A Dirichlet boundary condition for momentum is often invoked when we have what we call a no-slip boundary. For example, in CBE 331, you may have considered the flow of a fluid through a pipe if the velocity of the fluid goes to zero at the pipe wall, then we call that a no-slip boundary. Since the velocity of the fluid is zero at a boundary of the domain, the momentum also goes to zero. So this represents a Dirichlet condition in the momentum balance. Dirichlet conditions are also invoked for thermal energy and component balances when we know the temperature or the concentration at some position in the domain. When describing phase equilibria, the temperature or concentration on one side of the interface can be equated to the temperature or the concentration on the other side of an interface when the interface is a phase boundary. If a gas and liquid phase are in thermal equilibrium, then the temperature on either side of the phase boundary is the same. Similarly, if they're in chemical equilibrium, then the concentration of components in one phase can be related to the concentration of components in the other phase on either side of the phase boundary. This relationship might be expressed by something like Routes law or Henry's law. Recall that the Neumann condition specifies the derivative of the dependent variable at some point in the domain. The derivative of the dependent variable for momentum, thermal energy, and component balances is related to the flux. The Neumann condition arises in momentum balances when we specify a value for the shear stress at a point in the domain. Often we assume the shear stress is equal in two contacting liquid phases, and the shear stress is zero on the liquid side of gas-liquid interfaces. If our domain has symmetric boundaries, 
we typically invoke the assumption that there is no flux through that boundary. That can be true for momentum, thermal energy, or component balances. In thermal energy balances, we may also invoke the assumption that there is no accumulation of thermal energy at an interface, which means that the flux on either side of the interface must be equal. For component balances, we may encounter cases where there's a chemical reaction occurring at a surface, such as the surface of a catalyst, or an electrode in an electrochemical cell. If there's no accumulation, then the rate of reaction of component A should equal its flux at the interface. Robin conditions, or known combinations of a quantity and its derivative, often also arise in thermal energy and component balances. For example, if we invoke Newton's law of cooling, then the heat flux is a linear function of the temperature. The heat flux is given by the derivative of the temperature, and therefore we can combine a known value of the temperature and its derivative to arrive at a Robin condition. To give an example of how we might use these different boundary conditions to describe a chemical phenomenon, consider a chemical reaction of component A being consumed in a spherically shaped catalyst pellet. The catalyst pellet might be in a chemical reactor in which the surrounding medium contains a high concentration of the reactant A. We're interested in solving for the concentration profile of component A in the radial direction inside the catalyst pellet where it is diffusing from the surface towards the center of the pellet and simultaneously reacting according to a first order chemical reaction. If we write the balance equation for component A using spherical coordinates and assuming that there are no gradients in the theta and phi directions but only a gradient in the radial direction and that the system adopts a steady state so that there is no accumulation of A anywhere inside the catalyst pellet then the net rate of transport of A at any point in the pellet is related to the rate at which A is consumed. We'll show how we might write two different sets of boundary conditions to solve this problem. We might invoke a Dirichlet condition at the surface. That is, we specify the concentration of component A inside the catalyst pellet at little r, the radius, equals capital R, the radius of the pellet, and we call that the concentration of A at the surface. The concentration of A at the surface might be assumed to be the same as the concentration in the bulk fluid. At the center of the catalyst pellet, we can have no net flux across this point of symmetry. If there is no net flux at the center of the pellet, then according to Fick's law of diffusion, the concentration gradient must go to zero. So we can use that to specify a known condition for the derivative of the concentration. Alternatively, we could formulate a Robin condition at the pellet surface. The Robin condition says that the diffusion of A inside the pellet at R equals R is equal to some mass transport coefficient times the difference in concentration at the surface of the pellet and in the bulk phase. We would still use a Neumann condition at the center of the pellet because we must invoke the constraint that the flux at the center of the pellet has to go to zero, since there is no net transport through the center of the pellet. Either of these sets of boundary conditions might be used to define this problem, depending on the assumptions that we choose to make. In the next few videos, We'll introduce several methods for solving boundary value problems. The first one is called the shooting and matching method. In the shooting and matching method, we start with a known condition at one boundary, and then we guess the necessary number of additional initial conditions, and we solve this as an initial value problem using one of the initial value problem methods from chapter 7. For example, we might use the RK4 method. And then we check the solution at the other boundary to see whether it matches the known boundary condition. If it doesn't, then we need to make another guess for the initial conditions and iterate. This works very well for second order linear boundary value problems. For nonlinear boundary value problems, this will require an iterative method to reach convergence. If we have higher order ODEs, it will require that we guess multiple initial conditions at the left end of the domain. Alternatively, we can use the finite difference method. The finite difference method is invoked by selecting interior mesh points and then replacing derivatives with finite difference equations from chapter 6 at the interior mesh points.
Then we write our defining equation for the boundary value problem using those finite difference equations for the derivatives at each point in the domain and solve the resulting system of equations. The third method we'll talk about is called co-location. In co-location, we approximate the solution using a function that's easy to evaluate and differentiate. And we constrain the solution so that the defining equation is satisfied at particular points in the domain. Each of these methods will be introduced in subsequent videos.